Hi everyone, my name is Anastasia Lapatina and you're watching This Week in Ukraine, a video podcast from the Kyiv Independent. Every week, I sit down with one of my newsroom colleagues to dive into Ukraine's most pressing issues. And this time, we're talking about Russia's systematic kidnapping of thousands of Ukrainian children. I'm joined by the Kyiv Independent Deputy Chief Editor Toma Istomina. Toma, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. So, Toma, I think that for many Ukrainians, very few aspects of Russia's war in Ukraine have been perceived as quite as evil and terrible as crimes done against Ukrainian children. And apart from the thousands of kids who have been traumatized, injured, or killed, uh, many of them have also become victims of a huge Russian state scheme to essentially steal them, take these kids away from Ukrainian parents, guardians, state institutions, um, deport them to Russia, brainwash them, and sometimes even give them false identities. So I want to begin by asking, when did we first learn about this Russian deportation effort, and when did it all start? So actually, the world learned about this um, scheme, about this uh, mess war crime um, after the beginning of the full-scale invasion in February 2022, but it actually started back in 2014. Um, it started when Russia first invaded Ukraine and occupied first settlements, part of Ukraine's east, and Ukrainian authorities started reporting the kidnapping of Ukrainian children. They were mostly orphans, according to reports. Um, some of them were uh, kidnapped from uh, medical institutions, but these were like rare cases. Then uh, the next reports came actually in the days leading up to the full-scale invasion in February 2022. Apparently, Russia was already at that time preparing for the full-scale invasion. We knew that we had like hundreds of thousands of Russian troops on Ukraine's border. We all remember those reports um, in the build-up for the uh, bigger invasion. And uh, back then, Russian propaganda was using this topic, actually, and reporting that they're evacuating residents of Donbass um, to save these people, quote-unquote. Um, there were reports from local authorities, again, about um, forced deportations of um, Ukrainian children. And then after the beginning of the full-scale invasion, as soon as Russia started occupying new settlements in the east, in the south, um, these reports continued to come our way. Um, and uh, we learned more and more and more about how this was organized, how this was happening. At first, we had mostly uh, reports again about um, uh, kidnapping from uh, institutions, mainly medical institutions, and we're talking hundreds of um, children at that point, the early days of the full-scale invasion. Mm -hmm. But um, as early as March 21, Ukrainian authorities report that we um, already know about more than 2,000 children that have been forcibly deported to Russia from occupied territories. That's around a month, just a month after the beginning of the post Even less, even less than a month, mm -hmm. yes. And uh, and as early as middle April, um, the Ukrainian parliament recognizes um, the, this forced uh, deportation of Ukrainian children, as well as other actions that Russia was taking at the time is acts of genocide. And what's the Russian kidnapping mechanism here? Because, I mean, I assume that they're not just taking kids off the street or something. Um, how do they actually do it? Um, so this is pretty crazy because um, there are instances uh, where so much effort is put into these operations that it, it tells you how much important this is to Russia. There are several scenarios, basically, how children might get um, forcibly deported to Russia. Um, one of them is the one that I already mentioned, is uh, just uh, literal Russian forces come into institutions such as orphanages, um, maybe special institutions for children with disabilities, um, hospitals, and just uh, literally taking these children away um, in the occupied territories. 
Um, another one would be through the filtration camps. So in the early stages of the full-scale invasion, uh, we learned about uh, Russians uh, uh, forcibly deporting actually not only children, but also adults. And mm -hmm. um, basically uh, how it was happening, um, civilians were trapped in this um, poor conditions, sometimes in areas with very heavy hostilities where, mm -hmm. of course, it's impossible to continue to have a normal life. And Russia was denying these people um, a way to evacuate Ukraine-controlled territories and was saying that your only way is to go with us and basically forcing these people. And uh, these filtration camps that were set up, the special institutions were basically... Um, these people who were being forcibly deported, they were questioned about, you know, their background, their documents were withdrawn sometimes uh, in these institutions and all kinds of things were happening to me. And sometimes children would get separated from their parents in these institutions. Mm -hmm. Another way how it can happen is um, children were getting sent to special either rehabilitation or recreational camps. Uh, sometimes it would happen with the consent of parents. Sometimes it would happen without their consent. Russia was basically saying that, hey, send your kids to these camps to Russia um, so that they can be in safety. They can stay there for some time, mm -hmm. maybe get some actually, uh, you know, um, medical help or whatever and um, have some rest. And, um, and then they will come back after the hostilities are over. Mm -hmm. And uh, some parents actually voluntarily send their children, um, presumably, of course, with good intentions to send mm -hmm. their kids away. They didn't have a chance to send them to the Ukrainian controlled territories because the access was blocked. Not all parents have means to do it themselves. Not right. all parents can organize it. You, know, you might have... Uh, several kids, you might not be able to mm, uh, do this on your own, but um, Russia was basically offering this option of uh, sending uh, kids to camps, uh, some of them uh, located in occupied Crimea, some of them in Russia, and some parents actually did send their children, and the children, for instance, uh, some children would stay there for longer than... Um, uh, they uh, were supposed to for a month and month and month. Uh, in some cases, it was because the territories from where they came, they got liberated during this time when, and Russia was basically refusing to send mm -hmm. these children back to now Ukraine controlled areas. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, that when where it gets completely wild. Um, in some cases, uh, children would be sent to camps without parents' consent. Uh, we published this story um, about this woman who is a mother of six children. She's from Kherson. At the time when it was occupied, she was trying to hide her children from Russian forces. And uh, but at some point, they just came to her door and said that, you know, you need to send your children to Russian schools or you're going to have troubles. And she was forced to do that, even though she didn't want to, because Russian forces, as soon as they come to the occupied ter territories, they enforce Russian curriculums. Of course, their region of history, of culture, of uh, Ukrainian national identity and so on. And um, she didn't want to do that, but she at some point was forced to. And uh, one day she got a call from her 17-year-old son who said that I'm on the bus to uh, first, I think, Aleshki, but uh, eventually to Russian-occupied Crimea. And she was like, why? What? What happened? Mm -hmm. uh, what happened is that he got a call from his school and they told him that you need to go home and pack. We'll, we're going to pick you up. And there's an evacuation happening. So his mother was not even aware that her child was being sent to um, a different uh, territory. And he ended up in a um, camp in uh, Crimea. Later on, he was moved to, to uh, some occupied uh, settlement in Kherson Oblast, and um, she was finally able to get him back recently. But uh, that's another another mm -hmm. instance of how it might be happening. And then there's a case of uh, parents getting killed, right, yeah. and children just being taken away, and um, that's um, of course. Uh, something that is hard to wrap your mind around uh, your your parents get killed by um 
this aggressor state and you end up in this aggressor state. I think it's important to point out that many of these kids have living parents, not even just, you know, guardians or something, literally families who have lived with them, taken care of them, because I think often in the media we see that people refer to these kids as orphans, just orphans, but no, like, these are families being torn apart. Yes, totally, and there's this, there's this, uh, there are thousands of Ukrainian families or uh, thousands of caretakers who are going through absolute hell, and this mother mm-hmm. that I mentioned, that's how she described it, it was hell for her, because she couldn't, you know, I mean, what do you do in her, that situation? Yeah, she, she just couldn't um, take care of her child. And um, and uh, the absolute majority of these children that were identified, um, they do have either families or a parent or caretaker. So um, or orphans is just a small fraction of these children. And so... You've described how Russia essentially steals them, but what actually happens to these kids on Russian or Russian-occupied soil? Where do they live? What do they do for weeks and months? As I mentioned already, there's this whole system of uh, um, facilities that are involved in this um, war crime. These are mostly schools or uh, camps that are located in Russian-occupied Crimea, but also all across Russia, and it stretches all the way to far east, like Magadan. And uh, that's what we see in reports, uh, that uh, these children get, first of all, re-educated there, what Russia calls re-education, yeah. And um, they are basically taught uh, Russian history, Ukrainian history in the new region, um, and Russian propaganda interpretation. They also are forced to learn and like uh, sing the Russian anthem. Um, they are um, they get uh, punished for any sort of Ukrainian pro-Ukrainian position, any pro-Ukrainian stance. In some cases, even just saying that I am Ukrainian is not allowed. So a big part of what is happening to them mm-hmm. is this re-education. Uh, many children and NGOs involved uh, also reported uh, poor conditions, just in general, poor conditions and poor treatment. Uh, there were also reports about young boys getting military training wow. in like special facilities, uh, some of them located in Chechnya, according to some reports. Uh, mm-hmm. um, Yale School for Public Health did this huge study mm-hmm. and report on the whole um, uh, deportation thing. And uh, that's what they uh, mentioned. That's what they report. And uh, so young boys basically that have possibly had some issues with law in Ukraine, mm-hmm. um, they're being trained now to be presumably soldiers. Uh, in Russia. And, yes. And I mean, from what we saw with Russia um, forcing Ukrainians in Russian occupied territories to uh, fight on the Russian side and being threatened with uh, a bullet into their head unless they agree to that. I mean, I can easily believe that mm-hmm. these children could end up, you know, on the, front in the line. yeah on the front line at some point. And also some of these kids literally end up in Russian families. They get adopted. Uh, in Russia, right? Yes. Um, as we mentioned before, some of these children are orphans. According to Ukrainian authorities, we're talking about around between 4,000 and 5,000 children that were identified. These are orphans that ended up in Russia. And uh, some of them um, have been adopted by Russian families. Russian propaganda media report like hundreds of children that have been adopted. We can't verify these numbers. We can't um, get any confirmation, of course, but that's what Mm -hmm. Russia is saying. And um, absolutely crazily, um, one of the Russian um, citizens who did adopt one of the Ukrainian orphans, as we know from the Russian media, um, is Maria Lvova Belova, who is the Russian uh, Commissioner for Children's Rights and who is in charge of 
um, this whole system and operation of kidnapping Ukrainian children. She adopted away from Mariupol, I think, right? Yes, that's what media reports say. We can't verify this independently, but that's what we know from media reports that this boy is from Mariupol. She's very proud of it. I've also seen reports that the Russian authorities literally like falsify these kids' identities. So when when these children are adopted in Russia, they change their names, change their date of birth, or change their nationality, of course, which makes it basically impossible to to then track them down. I mean, some of these kids may already be old enough to know what's happening, but some of these are tiny children who may like may live their whole lives thinking they were born in Russia, right? Like not even realizing that that they're actually Ukrainian, which I think is just crazy and tragic. And then there's another thing that happens to Ukrainian children when they end up in Russia. What we see is that Russia, of course, as it always does, uses um, these um, children to post in propaganda what a savior Russia is that came to mm-hmm. rescue um, Ukrainian children who were suffering from um this war in ukraine and uh, um, we see interviews we see some public appearances there's this um, uh, famous uh, case uh, there was uh, this huge uh, absolutely shenanigans uh, propaganda concert on uh, in moscow Mm-hmm. on February 22, I think. Mm-hmm. So almost the anniversary of the full-scale invasion where Putin was given this huge speech and it was like all Russian flags, you know, in the best tradition of Russian uh, mass fascism. gatherings. Uh, fascism, also known as fascism. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and um, they brought uh, several children on stage. And among these children were kids whose mother, according to media reports, was actually killed by Shalin in Donbass. Oh my God. Um, They do have some family members and I think some of them are still staying with them in Russia. There's a bit of that going on and Mm -hmm. one of them was adopted um, by a Russian family. And um, imagine the cynicism. You put on stage children, you make them say thank you. There was this military guy, their commander or something like that. Um, and they were like thanking him for saving them. And literally some of these children, they lost their mother to Russia's war. Okay, so how many children have been kidnapped like this? Do we know the stats? We don't know for sure. But what we know is that um, the Ukrainian authorities, with the help of NGOs, uh, reports from parents, uh, reports from local authorities, we know that at least 20,000, close to 20,000 children have been kidnapped. And those are the ones who have been identified. So we know for sure who these children are. They have names. We know their um, uh, legal situation. Yeah, we we know um, all of that. And there's this uh, national database that Ukraine has, like children of war, and this um, number is there. Um, At the same time, Russia doesn't share with Ukraine any information on the number of children who have been forcibly moved, on the number of children who ended up on the occupied territories, mm-hmm. on, on in Russia itself. This system, they all point to the fact that it, the number might be significantly higher. Like we're talking thousands and thousands more. Um, mm-hmm. Some Ukrainian officials say it might be as high as 200,000, 300,000. So the number might be much higher. And then we have another number that is even bigger. It's the number that Russia um, officially presents is the number of children that it quote unquote saved um, and brought to Russia. And the number is more than 700,000. That is insane. So like all information from Russia you know, of course, we have to treat it with a grain of salt. We can trust it. Uh, but if it was to be true, that would be the number of children who ended up in Russia. So everything you've mentioned really doesn't sound like in the moment battlefield brutality, like, a, I don't know, a case of sexual assault or a killing of somebody. It sounds more like a really extensive program created and and backed and coordinated by the Kremlin. It is. It looks like. And uh, according to many reports, like all 
levels of the Russian government are involved in this. And you can imagine it takes like a lot of personnel to take care of these children. It takes a lot of personnel like to organize uh, supplies and all that stuff for these children, right? So, and then there's another a whole different issue of like their legal status. Of course, there's a lot of legal work involved mm-hmm. also. And so um, it does look at, look like a whole system, a whole network. Mm-hmm. Um, according to the Yale School of Public Health, uh, there are 43, at least 43 um, institutions that are involved in children kidnapping, specifically the ones where children are being kept meaning in occupied Crimea and all across Russia. And we also see, you know, that there's uh, Maria Lvova Belova, who I mentioned before, who is in charge of this process, who is very actively uh, communicating about this. We see that Putin himself, um, he approves of this program. He publicly speaks of of this program. So, of course, it's a whole system. And, uh, I mean, as spoiler alert uh, before we you know get to that but the international criminal court said that uh, there is very substantial evidence pointing to the fact that putin himself is in charge of this so speaking of putin didn't he sign a decree to actually make this whole adoption process easier i think there was a law that he signed yeah he signed a decree that basically makes um, the procedure of Ukrainian kids getting Russian citizenship um, easier. Presumably, according to reports, uh, to uh, make the process of um, children adoption in Russia simpler, faster. And um, that's um, the direct implication um, for Putin. And so how does Russia explain all of this? Like, what's their official rhetoric for why they're doing it? Because, I mean, of course, Russia lies all the time. But it's worth mentioning that when they talk about helping kids get away from hostilities, Ukraine also has, you know, a system and has put a lot of effort in evacuating kids from occupied territories, including from a huge number of volunteer organizations and also to mandatory evacuations in some cases with parents, of course. And it, it's not like Ukraine isn't doing that. No, of course it is. So Russia is lying. But what's their what's their official narrative on this? Yeah, as I already mentioned, Russia is justifying it by saying that it's just evacuating children, helping save the children from war-affected zones. Uh, um, saving orphans, um, kids from medical institutions uh, because they're uh, in danger there as well and you need special treatment, special care. So yeah, I want to make this very clear that Russia's war of aggression, Russia's unprovoked war, and Russia itself is the very reason that these Ukrainian children, other Ukrainian children, Ukrainian civilians need to be saved in the first place. Before Russia started its war, its invasion in 2014, before Russia launched a full-scale invasion, before Russia started to shell Ukrainian cities, uh, launch rockets at Ukrainian um, residential buildings, nobody needed to be saved here. So whoever is treating seriously, you know, this stance that we were uh, helping Ukrainian children, evacuating children, I I think they should stop doing that um, for the sake of their own reputation, because there wouldn't be this war if Russia didn't want this war. So basically, if Russia, as it says publicly, publicly, wanted to save Ukrainian children, it would have to just literally stop its war and do nothing extra. It's clear that, you know, all of Russia's explanations are not really grounded in reality. But what are their actual motivations then? I mean, we can't get into Putin's and Lvova Belova's head. One of the reasons they might be doing this is, and we have direct evidence of, their um, attempt to re-educate Ukrainian children. So they're basically trying to um, re-educate an entire generation of Ukrainian children, thousands of children, who even if they end up back in Ukraine at some point, they might not have the same views of themselves, of their country, of the Ukrainian identity, of our relationships with Russia. And um, basically, 
there's this entire generation of uh, Ukrainian children who might have a softer position towards Russia. Or they might full on consider themselves Russian. I mean, if you're what, like some of these kids are very young, like six, seven, five. This is the point when their Ukrainian national identity should be formed. But instead, it's the Russian one that's being formed. Exactly. And there's um, another reason why possible reason why is the political leverage that Russia gets. Um, It gets to bring up children in any negotiations, use it as a leverage and demand something, just like it's doing it with blocking this uh, grain deal that Ukraine and Russia agreed on. And it's constantly using it as a leverage to get some advantages for for itself. It's constantly like uh, calling on the world to drop some sanctions so that the corridor can be um, open and uh, mm-hmm. uh, functioning. And yeah, the, the ships can actually export grain from Ukraine. So it's it's the same. It gives Russia this leverage because, of course, Ukraine has been proven to be a country that cares about its citizens, that cares about um, human lives and that puts them you know, at the center of his decisions very often. So, um, of course, the negotiation table, for instance, at some point, Ukraine would care about the fate of these children. Ukraine, of course, would consider maybe something, right? Some uh, concessions. To, yeah, to save these children. Um, so um, that gives Russia a big leverage. And then another another point is just many actions that Russia is taking in Ukraine throughout this war they um, constitute um, an act of genocide, according to many international documents and uh, according to experts. And if Russia's purpose, intent, is to commit genocide against Ukraine, then that's just one of the ways it's doing it. Is that actually legally, according to the genocide convention? Yes. First of all, according to the Geneva Conventions, um, forcible deportation of children is uh, constitutes a war crime. Right. And second, according to the uh, Convention on Genocide Prevention, uh, forcible deportation of children with this evil intent to do so, it uh, does constitute an act of genocide. Um, and I mean, the evil intent is right here because there were other ways um, for Russia to try to resolve the situation of these children stuck in war affected areas but uh, one just has to turn on russian state tv to see the intent loud and clear exactly so considering the severity of all of this i mean you've already mentioned that it breaks every single international law there is on this topic how is the international community reacting to this i mean has there has there been any concrete action at all There were a lot of statements, of course, a lot of condemnation. Um, I have to say that like every time foreign leaders uh, speak about bringing Russia to justice, holding Russia accountable, um, children that were forcibly deported to Russia very often get uh, mentioned in this Mm -hmm. context um, with this um, emphasis that especially for this, we have to uh, punish Russia. Uh, so, of course, there's a lot of international support and a lot of pressure on Russia um, to uh, return these children. I'm speaking about the International Criminal Court's decision to issue arrest warrants for this particular war crime for Vladimir Putin himself and for Maria Lvova Belova, the Commissioner for Children's Rights that I mentioned already. So, these are the first warrants of that kind that we've seen since the beginning of war, right? Yes, that was uh, in uh, March this year, uh, so a bit over a, uh, a year since the beginning of the full-scale invasion. That was the first decision of a kind during this war. Many said that it was unprecedented, it was very fast, it was uh, um, welcomed by Ukraine, by um, Western leaders, because it gives a clear sign um to Russia, to anybody who wants to support Russia, to Russia's allies, to neutral countries, um, that there are actually um, grounds on which Putin might one one day get arrested and 
punished for this war crime. So it was a very important step. And of course, Ukraine welcomed it, but it was just the first step because Russia itself doesn't recognize the International Criminal Court. And as of now, it doesn't have like any consequences for Putin. But if he happens uh, to travel to any of the 123 countries that um, do recognize the court, then he um, is supposed to get arrested. So you've been mentioning Maria Lvova Belova for a while now. Um, people who closely follow the war know that she's the Russian official responsible for this entire scheme. But um, I don't think she's well known or actually known at all uh, in the broader public. So can you tell us a little bit more about this woman and how is it that she rose to prominence um, in the war so quickly? She's uh, an absolute cartoonish kind of character because she is she has this public image of this christian very caring mother she's married to a priest she has like 10 children five of them her own and five i think adopted Mm -hmm. and one of them is the boy from mariupol that we already Mm -hmm. talked about uh, so a ukrainian boy she has this absolute wild image you know of being such a um angel and um, religious person who is actually overseeing one of the worst uh, war crimes in the 21st century. It's absolutely crazy how contrasting, you know, the reality is of what she's actually in charge of um, to what she's presenting herself to be. Has Ukraine managed to rescue any of the kidnapped children? And also, is that even possible given just how bad the situation is? So from what we know, it's not impossible, but it's extremely difficult. So far, only 373 children have been brought back to Ukraine so far. There are very different ways how it usually happens. Um, Officially, Ukraine can't really... Um, get any of these children back because Russia doesn't include them in like in the exchange in the uh, prisoner exchanges. Uh, but uh, Ukrainian authorities do help parents, um, and um, Ukrainian NGOs are doing a lot of important work here. They literally finance trips of parents to Russia. They literally um, guide them through every step and help them get through this hell. I will give you an example of this mother that I mentioned from Kherson, uh, whose 17-year-old boy was moved first to Crimea and then to um, Lazurne, I think. It's a Mm -hmm. Russian-occupied settlement in Kherson Oblast, also in the south of Ukraine. So she's a mother of six. She doesn't have money for this um, lengthy trip to Russia. She couldn't just cross... Uh, the front line, there are literally hostilities going on. She can't just go from Ukrainian territory to Russian-occupied territory in Kherson Oblast. So she had to go all the way first to Belarus, then cross to Russia, then go all the way through Russia, then go to occupied Crimea, then go to occupied Kherson Oblast what? settlement in Lazurne. During this time, she had to go through two interrogations with Russian forces, with one of them happening in the basement for several days uh, in uh, Lazurne. She literally went through hell. And then when she, uh, when she finally uh, got to this boy, they went back. And um, on a Russian uh, border checkpoint from uh, Russia to Belarus, they weren't let out at first she had to try another one and then they ended up i think in um latvia if i'm not mistaken um so they crossed the border with latvia and you know by the time they were already in the eu territory she was still afraid that somebody would come and steal her child so that's the kind of process some uh, parents have to go through um, to get their children back and uh, so as I said it's not impossible but it's extremely difficult and there were many points of this trip that she described where she could far easily get killed or just simply and arrested uh, like I arrested mean, cap- captured or yeah. or just sent back you know and she was actually like she was interrogated about this um, NGO that helped her get there She was asked about how these people know where these children are, how these people know how to get here, uh, who is, you know, involved. 
also and also they actually both um her child and her they were offered an apartment in russian occupied uh, territory in kherson oblast and some money as a compensation they were trying to convince them to stay that's what she says and uh, they said that they don't want to and then russian forces like decided to took uh, to take advantage list of something here and they forced them to do this propaganda interview um, but how bad Ukraine is, and of course they agreed because they had no choice. They had they wanted to go back home. We're now going to be answering some questions that we got from our community members. The Kim Independent finally launched its very own membership system. Uh, so now all you have to do to support us is just go to our website at kimindependent.com slash membership. It takes as little as $5 a month and just a minute to get access to exclusive events such as discussions with editors like Tama and more. Um, so please take your time and support us. You also get a chance to submit questions and ask us whatever you want before every single episode of the podcast. So the first question that we got was, are there infants that are being taken, uh, kidnapped this way? Well, there are reports about infants who were among the children that were deported to Russia. Um, according to Yale School for Public Health, um, there were kids as young as four months who were among these forcibly deported children. Um, we don't know for sure in what circumstances and and how they were kidnapped, maybe from the institutions, maybe from maybe their parents were killed, maybe something else. But there are cases of that. Ukraine doesn't speak much about it. We don't know um, any further details, but there are some some cases that are being reported about infants, unfortunately. Another question was will Ukraine form an international special and investigative unit to track down all the missing abducted children that Russia took? So there's this effort um, that um, Irina Vereshuk announced um, a couple of months ago. She said that Ukraine is assembling an international coalition um, to basically help bring back these children, first of all, and second, also um, hold Russia accountable. We don't know any details about it. She said that some um, some foreign leaders already support this initiative, but there haven't been any further announcements so far. We don't know in what shape or form this will mm -hmm. um, uh, exist. Um, but I think also Ukraine is advocating for a special uh, war tribunal for Russia and uh, given that this is one of the war crimes uh, that Russia committed in Ukraine, I think this will be part of the uh, bigger case if that uh, war tribunal um, is ever formed. The third question, I think, is a very important one as well. The member is asking, is the UN putting all of their resources behind the Ukrainians and also putting pressure on the Russians to return every child to their parents? The short answer is, as far as we know, the answer is no. Um, but also, actually, Virishuk, speaking about this international coalition, she mentioned the UN uh, as one of the neutral intermediaries that could potentially participate um, in this coalition, in the effort, in the international effort to bring um, back these children. But we haven't heard, I think, from the UN about... Uh, where they stand in terms of this coalition, in terms of this initiative so Which far. Which is not very surprising, given their reputation in this war, unfortunately. Well, thank you, Tom. It was very interesting to listen to you. Thank you. Nice to have pleasure to be here. Also this week, Ukraine's intelligence chief, Karol Vodanov, said that Russia mined the cooling system of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant which is the largest nuclear power plant in Europe that's currently situated on territory that is occupied by Russia. The media reported that Russia transferred 11 Ukrainian prisoners of war to Hungary without any involvement of Ukrainian authorities. The POWs were reportedly still treated as prisoners there. They were kept in isolation and weren't allowed to directly communicate with family members. Hungary's foreign minister denied his government's involvement in the transfer and also said that all of the POWs were released. 
but Ukrainian authorities still haven't confirmed that. And according to Ukraine's interior ministry, at least 21 people were killed as a result of Russia's destruction of the Kahovka Dam in Kherson Oblast on June 6. Five of those people were killed by Russian shelling while trying to evacuate or get treatment. You can find our show on YouTube and other audio platforms every Friday morning. If you liked this episode, please subscribe to us and like our content wherever you're listening to this podcast. Please become a member of our community and donate to us to help us work by going to our website at kumindependent.com slash membership. And follow us on social media on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We'll be back next week. Thank you for watching.